Good evening and welcome to the February meeting of the British Empire Study Group. I'd like to thank everyone for joining tonight. Now we'll go through our typical spiel. Uh, this is the February 2nd meeting, the British Empire Study Group. For those of you who are not familiar with us, we're a bunch of men, women who enjoy postal history and philately. We meet online once a month, usually the second Thursday, but uh, this is an exception. It's February 2nd, and Valentine's Day is coming up next week, and we will do nothing to interfere with that. We're going to go for the next meeting, a little housekeeping stuff. Next meeting is on March 9th, and that is with Chris Doran talking about the Cape Triangles. That's the Cape of Good Hope. That should be pretty interesting. Now we'll go on to the main show, The Art of the Valentine by John Scott, ably assisted by one of my favorites, Claire Scott. Right now, I'll turn it over to my co-chair, Robert Lutens, to introduce John Scott. And thank you very much for attending. Oh, sorry, one more thing. I forgot to shout out Nancy Rosen from the National Valentine Association who posted this on her, her website. I want to thank you and thank everyone who shared information about this meeting. Rob, take it away. Thank you, John. A few words about the uh, program tonight. The origins of Valentine's Day can be traced back to Roman times. Lore claims that St. Valentine gave parchment hearts to Christian soldiers to remind them of their marriage vows. The Georgian era, which was 1714 to 1830, brought in the exchange of cards. Samuel Pepys, an English diarist celebrated for his diary, first published in 1825, gave us a fascinating glimpse into official and upper-class life in London during the 1660s. He recorded the practice then of sending expensive gifts, but by the late 1700s, the preferred expression was a handwritten verse or picture. Printers soon took advantage of this new fashion by marketing engraved images on writing paper rather than on cards. The first Valentines often brought together images of birds and cupids in printed or embossed form, the most delicate being the lace paper for which Great Britain was renowned in the 1830s. One of the most elaborate forms was the cobweb valentine, where the central section lifted up in a finely cut cage to reveal a hidden motif. By 1835, some 60,000 valentines were being sent throughout the London area. With the advent of the uniform penny postage in 1840, this number increased radically to half a million by 1864 and to over a million and a half by 1870. By the 1900s, the Valentine was in decline, not to be revived until the late 1920s. In 1936, Rex Whistler designed the first Valentine telegram for the post office. The revival was led by the Kansas City firm of the Hall Brothers, better known today as Hallmark who continue to be among the current market leaders, although challenged by online alternatives. A little introduction to our speakers this evening. We're very fortunate to have John and Claire Scott as our esteemed presenters for this, our, our February program. John Scott is a banker by trade, serving as a director of Morgan Grenfell and a managing director of Deutsche Bank. He was elected to the City of London Corporation until March of this year, serving as chief commoner. He is a GP, JP, uh, which is a magistrate, and served on the boards of the Museum of London, Gresham College, the Guildhall School of Music and Drama, Christ's Hospital School, and the Tams Festival Trust. Philatelically, he's a fellow of the Royal Philatelic Society of London, a life member of the U.S. Classics Postal Issues Society, a fellow of the Society of Postal Historians, and currently librarian of the Postal History Society, having served two terms as president. He's also an accredited lecturer for the Art Society and delivered a Smithsonian lecture in New York in 2016. Last but not least, John is the immediate past keeper of the Royal Philatelic Collection. John's wife, Clara Scott, is the editor of Postal History, the Postal History Society journal and a past president. So without further ado, here are this evening's presenters, John and Claire Scott. 
Right, good evening everyone, and hopefully you can hear me. Uh, obviously I had to begin with a heart, uh, and thanks very much for asking me to do this presentation this evening. Uh, this is actually a heart patented in 1907 in Canada, uh, and posted in that year uh, to Henley in, in England. But I'm sure you all know that the format of, of Valentine's before the advent of the envelope. Basically, this is what you saw from the outside. This particular one was posted, received in Belfast and posted in Dublin in 1834. And if you go inside, it is Miss Lindsay's Valentine with a classic image of forget-me-nots and roses. And you will see around the edge, there is an embossed border. Uh, these were mostly made by the firm of Dobbs in London, and this is actually watermarked 1830. So it was it was kept for about four years and then used. It's actually quite difficult to see these blind um, embossing. So what I've done here is uh, scan them at 200% and change the contrast somewhat, so that you can actually see the cupids in the top corner and the sort of ornamentation in the bottom. But this was actually used as writing paper and then the Valentine was print, overprinted on top. This is a Valentine sent to Miss Hayes in 1808. It was actually posted unpaid as were most Valentines because people were terrified that if they paid cash, uh, the postmaster would pocket the cash and destroy the letter. And on this one, it says inside, this old Valentine was sent to my great grandmother who married a Mr. Bohm. He died. She had a daughter by him, my grandmother, Mrs. Hillman. And we know from this actually, although it was posted on the 13th of February, it wasn't delivered until two days later, which is quite a long time in those days. And part of the reason for that is that Holden's directory of 1809 tells us that a J. Hayes was a mattress maker who worked from 10 Great Maze buildings. But you'll see from the, from the outside of this letter on bottom left, that it's actually addressed to 10 Maze buildings, Bedfordbury, which is part of London. And this may explain why it took an extra day to find him. You'll also notice that the, the slightly Romanesque appearance of the, the image on this Valentine. And that, brings us, of course, we've heard something about uh, St. Valentine. This particular origin, this is a, the earliest one image of him, taken from the Nuremberg Chronicle. Uh, but who was he? Uh, it could have been St. Valentine of Rome, who was martyred in 269. It could have been St. Valentine of Terni, martyred in 273. It could have been St. Valentine of Genoa, martyred in 307. Or indeed, there are seven other Valentines, St. Valentines, listed on the website Catholic Online. But the most commonly repeated folklore is that Valentinus gave comfort to Christians being persecuted by Emperor Claudius II, for which he was duly imprisoned. Uh, unfortunately, he then misguidedly tried to convert the emperor himself. So he was condemned to be beaten, stoned and beheaded outside the Flamian Gate. Uh, love comes into this unlikely tear when Valentinus restored the sight of his blind daughter of his jailer, Asterius, and wrote a, a farewell message on the eve of his execution, signed from your Valentine. It is said that a pink almond tree blossomed near the grave of Valentinus as a symbol of abiding love. But of course, the other thing we need to remember is that like all good Christian festivals, in fact, we can trace the festival back to pagan roots and the feast of Lupercalia in memory of the god Faunus. His sacred cave on a Palatine hill is reputed to be a place where Romulus and Remus were suckled by the wolf. And it was at this time of year that the priest sacrificed a goat and a dog before setting off on the circuit of the hill, striking any woman they found with strips of skin from the freshly slaughtered goats. They were really romantic types, and the goat thongs were called febra, from where the name of the month is derived, and were thought to encourage fertility. So now you know 
when somebody sends you a Valentine card, what it all means. And you get a Cupid is, of course, a classic image of Valentine. And they come in various forms of undress, uh, often wearing very little. And the bottom right one is American. It's actually more wearing more wearing more. It's more fully dressed. Mm. This is a an original Valentine. It's uncolored state. <clears throat> Most of the Valentines you see have a printed background, which were then was then colored. But this is a, an uncolored one, watermarked 1833, and sent from St John Street Receiving House in London. Starting off with cupids as being the sort of main theme of this part, and this is a, a continental one, unfortunately hand delivered. And for the life of me, I had never been able to in, uh, in understand what the address is, or let alone the city. So if anyone is listening to this can decipher it, uh, I'll be delighted for that. So the letter paper was embossed. In this case, it's on a coloured background, again by the firm of Dobbs, and was published as a sheet of writing paper. And you can immediately tell that the Valentine has been overprinted because it's so off-centred. And this particular example is from Liverpool in 1844 for Penny Red, Council of the Maltese Cross. And then we have another Cupid, and coloured and this one is sent from Grosvenor Square. Square, uh, it's Grosvenor Square to Whitechapel in 1834. Um, this one, it's a sort of tribute to the Americans because it is published by Turner and Fisher of New York. And somebody may be able to date it more precisely than that. Uh, but this particular example is unused. And I've really just included it to be, so you know these things, were well, you all know far more than I do about American Valentines. Hmm. So I won't mention any more, put my foot in it next. <laughs> Here we have Miss Shirley's Valentine of 1841. Un unpaid, as they often are, to Slough, from Windsor to Slough. Watermarked W. Watman, Turkey Mill, 1838. So again, this Valentine was kept for several years before paper was actually used. An example of a blind embossed background, again, writing paper. Here we have the rose, uh, again by a London firm of Rock & Co, another unused example dating from about 1840. Mm -hmm. We then get into the language of flowers, of course, as we did for rose. This is the, the pink of sincerity. And if you look at the Victorian language of flowers, the pink represents pure and ardent love. And this example was posted within, Ed within Edinburgh in 1835, and you'll see that it, because it was posted in the city, only, uh, to the city, only a penny was due. Here we have a, a variety of flowers, variegated tulip, which means symbolizes beautiful eyes. You've got a white lily, which symbolizes purity. And then you have a full blown rose and above it's two rose buds and that represents secrecy. And then you have the amaranthus, which means unfading. It's not actually dated, this one. It's watermarked 1815, but the, you'll see it's got a leak boxed mileage mark on it, the leak in Staffordshire in England, uh, which was only used between 1812 and 1824. So it must have been posted between 1815 and 1824. And that's as near as we can get. More ups here. We've got four cupids, two doves, a passion flower, which means devotion. And you'll see on the postmark at the top right of the inset that it, all you can really read is paid in a pale red. And because people didn't want to know, they didn't want the recipient to know where the Valentine was coming from, you often find the postmark isn't applied clearly so that the recipient didn't know, couldn't guess where it was, which receiving house it was sent from. But at least he's had the courtesy of paying this eight pence due, because eight pence is, would be about eight pounds nowadays. So he had the courtesy of paying it. Um, but it, and the postmark, as I say, 
it's it's amazing they could actually read that even that it said paid this is the earliest valentine i have it's hand painted and stenciled and written well the border is stenciled written in french and this particular valentine was found by father brennan in 1962 in an irish country house and the poem on the next page is addressed to Maria, who was actually somebody called Maria Rossiter of Rosemount, New Ross in County Wexford. I say, unfortunately, not sent through a post from my point of view, but nevertheless, you're lucky to find anything this early. Not at the endless knot of love is a classical motif for Valentine's, which you can you can start reading it any way you like in the in the ornate knot. Uh, this particular example was sent to Miss Lyles in 1827. It's watermarked 1826, and it was sent from Kim Bolton. Um, um, you can tell from the mileage mark, um, the mileage was excised in 1829. So we actually know it was posted in 1827, but if you didn't, that would also enable you to give it a rough date. We were very fond of cartoon figures in the early 19th century, made from everyday objects. So here the caricature is wearing a saucepan hat, a turnip head. He has a pail, a pail as a body or bucket. He has coarse sacks for his legs, brushes for his arms, arms for his feet. And this was sent from Lombard Street to Kent Road, again in 1825, 1825, I put 1827, but I'm correct, uh, at the cost of threepence to Mr. Searle. He made Park, a park of London. He was renowned for cheap satirical woodcuts. And this is one, I think it was used on the uh, on the advertisement for this webinar uh, shows a, a coachman and it said that you can see what it says at the top i don't know what miss allen thought of it um, when she received it in 1844 um, and sadly because we don't know what her connection is with uh, with uh, possible for trade of coach making Another vinegar valentine, as they're called. This one is to Charles Pratt in about 1828. From Uxbridge to Hillingdon, uh, with the mileage mark, the mileage removed, which you can just see in the top margin of the outside. Charles Pratt was obviously a popular young man. So he's getting another Valentine in 1834. Um, again, watermarked W. King, 1832, and sent from Hoborn Bars to Hillingdon. Uh, you'll see the, the green border, uh, also used for writing paper. And again, the Valentine would probably be overprinted at a later stage to make it useful for that purpose. Here we have Miss Hedworth's Valentine. Uh, postal history, in terms of postmarks, I have to say that Valentines, they tend to be sent locally, often within the same town. So the postal history from the postmark point of view is not, is seldom particularly interesting. And this is one of the more interesting ones in that you'll see that the figure three on the, outs on the address panel has a flat top. And this meant that it did not pass through uh, central London. It went from Richmond uh, to its destination. So that's that's what that's how you can tell the purpose of a flat top three. Yeah. This is a very well, really quite a late use of a of a, a Valentine in 1864, because of course by that time you've got the envelope. And so Valentines, as you'll see later, tend to shrink inside in size in order to fit them inside the envelope. But this was posted as a letter sheet. Uh, so you can see the address panel 
and the Valentine within uh, to Miss, Miss Master Turbot uh, from Alfreton to Brighton in 1864. Another vinegar valentine in late use because it has been, although it could have fitted in an envelope, it's actually been folded as, a, as, a, as if it was an old entire and then sent at the printed paper rate from Cheltenham to Hayward's Heath in 1834, 1884. And you can see what it says at the top, the ode to a greengrocer. And I'm sure you can all read it, but just in case, you are just as mouldy as the goods you sell. And oh, tis wonderful the lies you tell as you stand at your door and cry, all fresh today, pray just step in and buy. Mm. Sadly, we don't know what Barclay Sumner had to do with anything with greengrocing, but maybe he was um, one of these greengrocers who sold less than fresh produce. This one is, is a, Whereas of all Valentines so far, this sort of type of Valentine is actually quite common. Uh, it's got a very rudimentary embossed border, and it is, as you see, if you folded it up, you could easily get it inside an envelope. I have never yet seen a used one with its envelope, uh, and this one, of course, doesn't have an envelope, and you'll see it's really quite disparaging. Uh, I'm really afraid that your hopes for a husband are past, and these things date from about 1860. Another one, equally, well, not very pleasing to a recipient, um, very pleasing to look at, but rather too fast. And the the head has actually is actually a chromo litho scrap, which has been stuck on to be printed and coloured border uh, body. I then want to move on to slowing backwards here, but I wanted to move on to what I might call mechanical um, valentines, where people have sort of manipulated the paper to create a different sort of image. So this one is, uh, I think this sort of cut work is much more prevalent in America at this period than it was here. Uh, but this is, you can see really why not many of these cut work valentines were sent through a post, because the blue background I've added, so you can actually see the cut work, and consequently, you've got a very delicate product, which must have been really quite expensive. And here they are entrusting it to the post office. This particular example was posted from Kingston to Arundel in 1809. And costs the recipient sixpence to receive. Here is Miss Gwynne's Valentine, 1817, um, which again has, you see the rose in the middle. And if you lift the rose, that is what you see underneath, loving couple. We then have what are called cobwebs or sometimes cages. Uh, this is a piece of, again, Bob's embossed paper sent from Ramsgate to Canterbury and walked to Mart 1821. Sadly, nothing else on it enables us to date it any more closely than that. But if you lift up the center, here's another Valentine first, another cobweb sent to Miss Ayers in 1835 from Henley on Thames. Again, Dobbs embossed paper, watermarked 1833. And I'm hoping that the next one will show you what happens. Yes, if you lift up the cage, which as you'll see, it's just amazing cut work paper. I have no idea how they did it. And what you have underneath is another image with Britannia, of Cupid, and the words, tis vain to oppose. This paper was even more fragile than cut work. It's just amazing how, how finely they cut the paper. I think they can nowadays just about do it with a laser, but it's still nothing like as fine as the Victorians, and nobody really knows. I don't think a machine has ever been, has survived. Uh, which tells you precisely how they did it without any uh, any bits of paper loose on the back and of course none of the scorch marks that you could get in uh, laser cut paper. This one has been sent within America uh, to New Haven 
It was printed by, the paper was made by Mansell of London. So it was obviously exported probably to the USA. And you can see the page mark. And in the bottom left-hand corner of the cover, you can see a very, a red circle. But of course, the consequence of being uh, lace work, lace paper, is that there's no, nothing, no real surface to which, to which you can read, on which you can read the wording of the postmark. So we didn't know where it was sent from, but it was going to New Haven. And on the back of it, you can see a little wafer seal saying, from you know who. Sadly, of course, we don't know who it was from. There's another example of a sort of mechanical Valentine, because if you open his waistcoat, you'll find a heart with a lady inside it. Again, I would like to find one, and again, the paper is laced paper, and here I've added a, a red background, so you can see the effect of the lace work. Not surprisingly, this never went through a post, probably delivered by hand. Um, far too precious, I guess, to entrust to the post office. Here we have Mr. Will's Valentine, a sort of high Victorian style surround, which I think rather detracts from the image. Uh, posted from Kensington Gravel Pits in London to Paddington in 1847. And he has at least paid for it, which makes a change. Then we have combinations of base work and cut work and embossing, uh, which are even less likely to go through a post. And most of them were actually, if they were kept, they were stuck in scrap up Victorian scrap albums. So this one is going to Miss Mooney in 1860. Another very, very rudimentary woodcut by A. Park, sent to Miss Waddell of Scotland in Scotland from Haddington to Edinburgh in 1849 with a penny red. These Valentines, I mean, they must have been, they must have cost a penny each because it really is pretty, it's pretty primitive work. And the hand colouring isn't great either. I put this in because I felt we had to give Charles Magnus a look in. Uh, this is actually a version which is not recorded by Richard McKinstry in his book, Charles Magnus, Lithographer. Um, and I've dated, you can date, the only way you can date it, this is of course Lax's envelope, uh, is from the time that Magnus was at 12 Frankfort Street, which was between 1854 and 1868. In America, you have these fantastic Printed on huge printed envelopes, which I just love. But sadly, nearly everyone, nearly all the examples I've ever seen in America have lacked a content which can be without doubt attributed to that envelope. Because sadly, of course, Valentines weren't intended to be written on. And unless your Valentine is written on, you have no way of knowing whether it belongs to that envelope or not. And I'm sure some unscrupulous dealers have added on Valentine's two envelopes before now, uh, just to enhance them. This one, as you see, was sent from Glastonbury uh, to Vermont, and on the back it has this little wafer seal with the words, God bless you, and a loving couple embracing on a park bench. We didn't really have this type of envelope at all in Great Britain. They were nearly all much smaller on the whole, and blind embossed, so no colour. Let me get on to things which have been added to Valentine's. So this one has a, a silk panel in the centre, mounted on lace paper, um, and it gets more and more intricate as the century comes to an end. So here we have Miss Foster's Valentine, uh, again, with a, a silk panel in the center of this uh, lace paper. Uh, the flowers have all been stuck on, that have appliqued, and the gold ring at the top is actually a gold ring. Sadly, of course, most of our letters aren't, on the whole, aren't addressed to important people. So even if you use the internet, you can seldom find out who they are. But in this case, we're helped by the fact that 
the envelope is addressed to Miss Foster, Sale Priory, Manchester, and posted in Chester in 1846. Now, at the time, Sale Priory was the home of John Frederick Foster, who lived between 1795 and 1858. And when Miss Valentine was sent, he, his two daughters, Caroline Louisa, who was aged 21, and Mary Eleonora was aged 16. We don't know which one it was, of course, but I, I would go for the older one, I think, Caroline. And she married Edward Law, Edward Lloyd of Manchester, with whom she had seven children and died in 1900. Whereas Mary married James Collier Harter, also of Manchester, in 1851. And she had five children before dying, probably the exhaustion, aged tw just 27 in 1857. Another Valentine, again with cut work, um, with lots of things attached to it. So you've got the appliqued flowers, you've got the lace on the bed, and you've got the baby, who all attached separately to this Valentine. And they actually had few workshops uh, consisting of hundreds of women. Uh, the scraps on the whole came from Germany, and they spent all their time sticking them on to make products such as this. You have another one with a needle attached and the text, you can probably read it, it says, I hope you won't get the needle because of my pointed remarks, but I'm died if I don't love you with all my heart. Uh, sent from Potter's Bar to Petworth in 1898. And they got so elaborate, but in the end, they got too big to put in envelopes. So they had to be put in little boxes. And you can imagine how many of these little boxes have survived. So the right hand one was made by a firm called Thomas Stevens of Coventry in Warwickshire. And if any of you collect uh, ephemera more generally, you may be familiar with Thomas Stevens bookmarks and Stephen graphs, which were made of printed silk. So this is a, an example of his Valentine, posted from Ride to Sandown on the Isle of Wight in 1885. And on the left-hand side, we have an unattributable uh, Valentine, posted from Tunbridge to Manchester. Uh, sadly, you can't see what date it is, but it's going to be roughly uh, the same period, 1880s. This is what I call a step too far. Uh, Valentine so covered in bits, uh, but the message is totally lost. Um, but nevertheless, they were very fashionable um, in the late 1890s and early 1900s. But there was a, there were still a few companies that made sort of what I would call proper images. So this picture is the image in the center, again on later attached to a piece of lace paper is by Walter Crane, who was a, a well-known artist at the time. And um, there's a whole series of these Valentines. <clears throat> this is an example, as I said, when the envelope came in, the Valentine shrank. And here you can see on the right-hand side, a piece of note, note paper, probably not necessarily designed for purely for Valentine's Day because this was a fairly common, fairly common to have these sets of note papers with different floral motifs. Um, and it would have been folded up and put into this little envelope with the, a, a quote from Shakespeare on the wafer seal, what I was, I am, posted from Ashton under Lyme to Altrincham in 1848. Another American example, posted from Burlington, and you'll see on the envelope at the top right that Burlington and the date have been written in manuscript uh, together with the five cents. Uh, the letter is on the left, probably produced especially for Valentine's Day, although there's no attribution on it. And it's sealed with 
a wafer seal showing a couple in bed together, perhaps slightly uh, premature for Valentine's Day. Uh, and the words say, there you are, Mr. C, with your meanings again. Now, this, this type of uh, wafer seal, it stems from a series of articles published in the magazine Punch, uh, the London magazine from 1845, which were later illustrated on note paper by Charles Keane. So I've no idea how it got to America or why it was used for Valentine. And I have never yet seen a complete sheet of these Valentines because you, of these wafer seals, because as you can see, it was cut out of a sheet rather like a postage stamp. Another Valentine, again, envelope size, so what we call note paper. Uh, I've called it a Brill Valentine because at the left of the cover and it's sideways on is an undated circle for the village of Brill. Um, posted to Tetsworth in 1849. And there is actually handwriting on the other side of the Valentine, <clears throat> which enables you to date, which enables me to be confident that it is original to its envelope. Going on a voyage was a typical image for Valentine. So here you can see the couple on the shore with the cherub have a, a preparing the boat and in, in the distance, the church. And a lot of Valentines have this sort of imagery. Miss Soper's Valentine from 1903 took the form of an imitation telegram printed by the firm of Charles Good. Um, this would really have been at the cheapest end of the Valentines um, because the envelope is, the paper is so bad, but well, you can see how, what state the paper's in. And the Valentine is such thin paper that it is almost falling apart at the creases. Um, but anyway, Miss Soper, sent from within cows in the Isle of Wight, was probably chuffed to get it. Valentine postcard, 1903. Again, very much cheaper, obviously, than buying a, a real Valentine card. Sadly, we have no idea who published this Valentine card, postcard, uh, but it does show a postman delivering a Valentine, probably a proper one, to a lady at the window. This was posted in Lancashire in 1905. Art does make a return to Valentine because in the 1930s, the post office started producing special Valentine telegraphs. And here is a, a telegram by the well-known artist Rex Whistler. But war did have an impact. And in the Second World War, there was no way you could have, you had access to uh, pretty Valentine cards. So this is what I would call wartime economy, uh, sent by Len Rowe to his sweetheart, Miss Goddard, at the Steam Packet Inn uh, in Devonport, 1945. And you'll see it's got the box uh, telegraph office sensor mark. But sadly, we have absolutely no idea, obviously for sensible reasons, where Len sent this telegram from. And we, we've really got to the end, virtually. Uh, this is 1950s. And I said earlier that on occasion you could only see part of a postmark on the letter because people didn't want to know where it came from. And the other tradition is that you could ask the postmaster to deliberately smudge the postmark to disguise the post office of origin. And there's no doubt at all in my mind that when he applied the state stamp, he twisted it so that you cannot see any of the lettering in the postmark. And so we don't actually know even when it was sent, but it is obviously 1950s, I would guess. And it shows the, the ideal 1950s man wreathed in pipe smoke and her dreaming of 
of him holding her, her in his arms. So that completes uh, this presentation. I hope you've found something that you enjoyed in it. I hope that I'll see some of you when we come over to Boston in 2026, when we'll also be celebrating the 90th anniversary of the Postal History Society. That's the English version, which started in 1936. So thank you all very much. And I'm delighted my young assistant, Claire, will answer any questions you have. <laughs> that was wonderful, John. Thank you so much. Um, we have a question about an unpaid issue. Was there not an issue of a woman or a man having to pay for their own card to receive it, particularly if you had many suitors? <laughs> it was expensive. Yes, it would be. I mean, it was. It, it, it is very expensive to receive these, and I don't. It's sort of a mixed blessing, isn't it? Getting a Valentine where the person sending it can't be bothered to prepay it. Right. So I've no idea what. Sadly, we don't know what the lady's reaction was at the door when she was asked to pay eight pounds to receive a Valentine. Yeah. Um, Alice Crosley is asking uh, if any of these Valentines were sourced from a particular archive or collection, or is this your personal collection? This is all my, it's all my personal collection. <coughs> but I have been collecting this stuff for 69 years now. <laughs> I, I was a late starter. I didn't start till the age of six. <laughs> I, I get what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> um, we celebrate Valentine's Day on February the 14th but some of the covers that we saw were dated later in the month. When, when did February 14th become standard? As far as I know, it always has, always has been. I'm okay. trying to think of which ones were. So just some late mailings possibly there. Um, on that 1830, the 1834 Valentine, so uh, John Bonsma is asking, what is the middle cupid holding? If we can find that that image. Let's go back and share screen again. Yeah, the 1834 Valentine. Wow. <clears throat> I'm just going to remind people when I bring you over, you have to accept to come over and you're welcome to turn your camera on or not or and uh, unmute, but you have to accept coming over or I can't bring you over. Hmm. We're not sure if this is the correct one or not, or it could have been one at the beginning. Yeah, it is the 1834. Move from 1834. <coughs> oh, He's got wings He's got on. The wings of the doves. Wings of the doves. Yes. He's got two doves in front of him. In the, okay. in the, the cupid in the center. Okay, that that I think that answers that, John. There's a wing there and a wing there. And what are these? That's his yes. wing. That's his wings, yes. Wings of his own. Yep. John, where are you most likely to come across these these really old Valentines? Sadly nowadays, it's only in rather expensive auctions. In okay. the old days, when I first started collecting dealers never looked inside their letters but sadly they do nowadays <laughs> um, and also most of the sort of archive family archives and obviously most of these would have been held by individuals have long since been dispersed so you i'm afraid you have to wait for, not necessarily for dead collectors because some collectors do sell stuff before they die um, but i would say that it has to be a collector who's no longer interested in the subject and put some up for auction, but they do fetch. Um, you're talking about a three-figure three sum for oh. a, a Valentine such as this nowadays, and that's in pounds, so a couple of hundred dollars minimum. 
All right, John. All right, those are the, the last of the questions that we have that anybody listed here. Um, we can open up to um, questions from the audience now. Well, John, I did have a question. How did you yep. start collecting Valentines? Well, I started, I started off at <laughs> age six, I didn't collect Valentines. I was too young to even know what it was all about. Um, I started collecting stamps at the age of six. And then I inherited my uncle's wonderful Edwardian album with a printed page for each stamp. And of course, you could never afford the high values. So when I went to university, I sold the stamps and to a stamp dealer who happened to have two charters signed by James V. VI, a man of Denmark, and a whole load of letters from me, aide de to Marshal Beresford during Peninsular War, which he'd never read. So that took me into being interested in what was going on inside the letters. And of course, therefore, it's not just Valentine's, any, any sort of engraving. Well, I've, I've done that four or five times, Pat. Doesn't work. Doesn't work. There it goes. It, it is. You've got your hand raised. Okay. <laughs> John, we got an, another question just uh, showed up. Martin yep. Lorenzi wants to know, uh, first of all, thanks a lot for the great review. What about the earlier period Valentines, like the devotionals and the German frock tours? Do they belong into exhibits like these? <laughs> and what about the tokens of love, like the gloves? Yes, I'm, they would all belong to, I mean, I've, I've, because my interest is really postal history and what was going on inside right. the letters, I don't do the objects. Okay. But yes, I mean, it all has, if you were doing this as an exhibition, a public exhibition, you would want to have the story going backwards and indeed further forwards um, and include any sort of objects you could associated mm -hmm. with Valentine's Day. I'm getting too old, so I, I, get, I used to collect objects but there's such a nuisance to carry about that I actually gave up collecting objects. Yeah. I think Dan Walker has a question. Is that yes, right, this is John, this is Dan Walker. Hey, Dan. How Hi there. Today? Good to see you. Um, I noticed that most of the, um, all virtually all the material, even the, uh, the one with the uh, uh, very thin paper was in very good condition. Is this normally the way you uh, are uh, able to acquire Valentine's? You don't, frankly, you don't see many, which I mean, not, just they were treasured on the whole, um, <laughs> both by the recipient and by the subsequent collectors. On the whole, they're in pretty good condition. But also the paper, of course, at this period was made of offcuts from the textile mills. Mm -hmm. uh, so paper up to the mid Victorian period is actually much more robust. Right. And the paper, some of the papers, for example, the, which one was it? Well, the, the Cupid's official telegraph and the Rex Whistler, the paper is of much lower quality mm -hmm. and it is almost falling to bits. And ultimately, it probably fall, fall to bits of its own volition. Thank you. That was a great, great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Bob Vogel, you have a question. Yes, thank you so much uh, for that uh, excellent presentation and the wonderful eye candy. That was just uh, astounding. <laughs> I'm, I'm intrigued on how you shaded the lace work or the embossing with the colors. Uh, it, it looked like you did with a paintbrush. It was No, I, just put a, I put a sheet of colored paper under it. Oh. And then, and then scan it. Okay, okay. So you see gotcha. the color coming through the paper. Okay, I thought it was a reverse that you had painted over top of this stuff. Thanks, yeah. okay. Makes sense, thank you. You can choose your color. It doesn't have to be yeah. blue or, or red. John, who did the hand painting? Was it was it somebody um, that would purchase a, a sheet of paper from the printer, or was it done at the printer? I think hand painting was nearly all done by a recipient, by the sender. Sorry. Okay. So you bought a you bought the black and white, for example, print, 
and then you you culled it yourself. The colouring oh. is often so bad, but nobody nobody else, nobody would have done it commercially. <laughs> okay. David, you have a question, David Webb. Well, I think Bob just answered it. Uh, <laughs> you know, I was wondering how much of the artwork is actually hand done. I, I, I noticed, noted the, you know, the coloring, of course, seemed to be, uh, uh, you know, hand done and, and probably personally by each who sent the Valentine, but the pen and ink or the penciling or the background work, how was that done? Is that all lithographed or was, I think Bob really just asked the question I, and you've answered already. So first of all, I'll just, you know, I'll, I'll just second the other comments, John. Fantastic collection and very well presented, and I enjoyed it immensely. Such a scope of work there. Of course, you didn't have much during most of this period. You didn't have color printing, and I'm thinking that the the Brill Valentine of 1849 is probably the earliest one I've, of this collection, which has which is color printed as opposed to being hand colored. Wow. Tony, you have a question. Uh, yes, John, excellent, excellent presentation and material. Um, Thank you. A question, though, in in Sweden in the uh, in the nineteen hundreds, the post office would handle telegrams in which there were specially printed telegram forms, and then when you got your telegram, it was it was printed on a, a special a special form. And I'm not sure whether there were Valentine forms amongst those. There were the usual Christmas greetings and birthday greetings and, and such like. I was wondering whether there were whether there were the special um, Valentine's telegram forms which might come under this collecting realm. You have to hope there's somebody else who knows more about Swedish postal history than me, because I can't I've never seen one, but I so I can't answer the question. <laughs> Yeah, there were there were full. You could actually get a, a full booklet of full. But um, I just don't, off the top of my head, know whether there were Valentine's Day ones for them or not. Mm. Bill Foster. No answer for that one. I guess we'll have to get back to him. Miriam. Hi. Um, a couple of questions. I may have missed uh, some things that you said, what was the secrecy about why, where something came from? Why was it often obscured? Well, because Valentines are meant to be anonymous. The recipient is not meant to know who sent the Valentine. Um, just out of uh, curiosity, I often get letters from friends in the UK and they don't put a name or address. Is that common from the UK? No, it just means you're very popular. These are all Valentine cards you're getting, are they? No, these are just regular mail from friends. They're right. not, you know, soliciting money or, you know, ads or anything. And I never quite understood that. Is that common? Not among friends of ours. Okay, just my friends. Um, when we're... <laughs> When we're perhaps envelopes, it, perhaps uh, it's what we call it's probably what we call junk mail. No, it's from friends. Mm -hmm. I uh, I open them and they are legitimate. Um, when were the envelopes um, invented? Well, they weren't mass produced until the time of the Great Exhibition, when Waterloo's had a machine uh, at the Great Exhibition in 1851, uh, which mass produced, mass produced, printed and gummed envelopes. But you do get them. I was preparing another lecture today and there was an, I had an envelope which dated from about 1809 and it even had posted in this country and it even had a little cutout, a little semicircle cut out of the back. Um, so you could, you could more easily extract the letter and I hadn't actually noticed that semicircle until today. And that is certainly the earliest, what I would call manufactured envelope, because most of the envelopes you see at that period were just hand folded. This must have been manufactured. And because I only saw it today, I have no idea. It certainly isn't common. Um, but on the whole, you don't get them until 1851. 
in the UK, I should say, because in this country, you were charged per, uh, up until 1840, you were charged postage based upon the number of sheets of paper you used, and an envelope constituted a second sheet. So the postage was double. And the only envelopes you find being used before 1840 are from members of parliament, peers and commons, uh, who had free postage and therefore didn't need mm -hmm. to worry about the cost. Mm -hmm. Thank you. John, we've got a question, especially about those, the cards showing the, the ugly old maid or spinster in that. Were those cards sent with, uh, you know, with the, with the intention of humor, or were they hurling an insult? I think it's, I suspect it's humor, because you do get, you get Christmas cards in the same vein. You know, a robin stabbed through the chest and blood pouring out. And huh. um, it's sort of, it must be, it must have a rather macabre sense of humor, because I don't know who you would send that card to. Okay. Right, right. I, I get that. Okay. Joan? We have Frank. Frank Bloom, you had a question. Well, no, more like a comment. Well, you're talking about um, envelopes not being used. And then prior to that, everything was done by sheets of paper. Same in the U.S. Uh, until um, they decided to do the Uniform Postage Act, which came shortly after Great Britain's. Ours was 1847. Mm -hmm. You guys had the, we're, 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 we're the, the headway there. You guys did it first and then everybody else thought, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> But you do get you do get them on continental Europe before before eighteen forty. Oh, welcome everybody. I mean, I'm still bringing people over. It was um, I'm a little slow on the uptake. So, if you want priority when you're coming over, just um, raise your hand, and I'll I'll. I'll bring you over. Joan, Fantastic. can you hear me? This is Ed Grabowski. Yes, Ed. I, uh, I was wondering if I could share uh, share the screen. Of course you can. I'd, I'd like to show something, and if it all works, I'll be able to do it. If not, I'll just have to forget about the idea. <laughs> give it a try, Ed. <laughs> okay, where do I, I... I don't see a... Uh, you should see a share screen on the bottom. It may be hidden, so you just bring your cursor down to the bottom. You yeah, I'm at I'm at the bottom, and uh, oh. I don't I don't see it. You don't see a green sh uh, no, share I don't, screen. I don't see the see the share screen. Are you sure? Turn you can't see it. Yeah, turn the camera on first. Camera. It's right beside the chat box. Oh, you got it, Ed. There you go. Now don't tell me that was sent to Segno. So, uh, tell us about it, Dad. <laughs> Lovely lady, tell us about her. What's her phone number? <laughs> I love the basket of fish and the grass. <laughs> and I'm wondering what that means. Ed, could you hear us? <clears throat> it says first of April at the top. So it's um April Fool's card. Easter. First of April. 
I don't oh. think so. It's first premiere. Oh. It's French. Ah. So it's got one ER premiere, and then it's, uh, yeah, it's French. Hmm. And it's a, yeah. Yeah, my dear fish, you have all my affection and my love. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> Somehow, I, I don't I don't know if it was an April Fool's thing, but I think he actually had, uh, you know, called it called his girlfriend fish for whatever fish, reason. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah oh boy and thank you for sharing i think we have another question surrendra could you hear me surrendra no i don't think he hears us i don't think he hears us well, surrender if you hear us, you could chime right in. And I'm going to take your screen share down so we could see people. Florence, welcome back, Florence. Thank you. I thought on the other side of this card, it said April 1. Yeah, it did. Mm -hmm. No? Yes. So April Fool's Day? Hmm. <clears throat> You know, that card was mailed in St. Pierre Miquelon. Yeah. And the primary industry of that small country is fishing. So yes. sending a card no, no. to a no. dear fish is probably an endearing thing. No, it's, okay. it's, can you hear me now, Joe? Yep, now I could hear you, Ed. Okay, Le Poiss the Poisson d'Avril, back at, at, in the 1900s and maybe before, uh that that was uh valentine's day in france the equivalent oh. and you would you would send cards and letters of endearment to your loved ones uh with through the symbol of the fish okay oh. and if we fast forward to today they and if you google poisson d'avril today uh it's actually a a, a a an april fool's type joke where you try and, and paste a little cutout of a fish on someone's back without them noticing it. Uh, and, and they walk around work all day with this silly fish on their backs. And, and that's a bit of a joke, but this postcard from St. Pierre and Miquelon uh, is a nice item from there, but it's very much a French tradition in 1900 and shortly before the Poisson d'Avril uh, you send expressions of love to to your loved ones. So Poisson de Brio is the one day in the year you can give someone the fish eye. Uh, <laughs> no, you give them the whole fish. <laughs> oh, gosh. So then Valentine's Day is really more English? Is I, that right, John? Sorry? Is, is Valentine's Day more an English tradition? I would say certainly in English speaking. I've seen from Australia. Most of the ones I've seen have been from um, English speaking countries like Australia or America. But I don't know how, how prevalent it was elsewhere in the world. How about Italy? Never seen one. Don't know anything about it. Lawrence, we got your question, right? And yeah, um, okay. Perfect. Surendra, could you hear us? Yes, good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Uh, yes, it, yeah, I am from India. Yes, it's a wonderful collection I had seen first time in my life. Do you have Valentine's Day in, in India, Surendra? Yes, yes. The people are now celebrating the Valentine Day, but it's a uh, very nice collection I have seen, I had never seen before. Oh. Yeah. Thank you very much for showing up. And it's all John's work. So John and, uh, and Claire. So they, John's they've got a book out and, and he's trying to find out if he can find that 
missing any foreign Valentines. <clears throat> Having been asked if there were any Italian. I mean, we've never seen any. Germany, I think. Yeah, Germany did. Mm -hmm. they, they did all the cutouts. Mm. We, we got a note here from Daryl Templer uh, talking about those, those caricature cards. He said there were cards that were sent as insults, and the insult valentines have been described as vinegar valentines. Yeah. Hmm. Victorian insult valentines cards for foes, bullies, and jilted lovers. So It says in this book I'm reading that the, although the scraps for making valentines, the Chroma Lytho ones, were made in Germany, the Germans as a people are not associated with the production of valentines nor celebrating St. Valentine's Day in anything like the same manner as the English and Americans. Many other countries, however, have observed the day by the sending of tokens, and even the Chinese had their Valentines. The French produced a certain number too, though the cards did not sell well in America. And he says the observance is largely Anglo-Saxon in character. Hmm. Well, I think if the French sent fish, I'm not sure how I would feel if my Husband sent me a fish card for Valentine's Day. From the Godfather. Yeah. <laughs> Hush. Those vinegar cards, those seem really mean, John. Are they? they are. <laughs> yes. Wow. I, I see Nancy has, Rosen has joined us. Hello, Nancy. I, no. can't, I can't see you, but I can see your name. I can... you've, got many, you've got many more Valentines than I have. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Yes. I, I can't. I don't know how to make the camera work. I've been fighting with it because I wanted to be included in your video. It's such a pleasure to see you and and see Claire hiding there. Hi. <laughs> yeah. And we have a number of people from our National Valentine Collectors Association who are have joined here, and uh, every I announced it, and people were very excited. So it's mm -hmm. a pleasure to to be able to see you and see your valentines. And, uh, Sadly, it's, it's not quite it's not quite as good on PowerPoint. When I do my lectures, live lectures, I take along some of the Valentines so people can actually see and if they want to handle the originals. Right. Because you, you, PowerPoint's wonderful, but it, you lose a certain something not being able to see the original. Yes, well, that, that tactile quality. But, but I love all of the language of flowers and all of the symbolism. <clears throat> There's so much symbolism in every image. <clears throat> <clears throat> And that's wonderful. So we have a lot of different American history here uh, with our American Valentines, a lot of comic Valentines and our companies, McLaughlin and How Howard made some of the incredibly scathing uh, comic Valentines. Um, but this, this was wonderful Valentine history. Thank you so much. We'll have to study our watermarks and our postmarks. Yes. It's because I, I mean, my my interest in what's going on inside the letter is so wide that Valentine's are only a small part of it. And in April this year, I start a PhD at oh. the University of Reading in the Department of Typography and Graphic Communication oh my. on the subject of printed, right, personal printed writing paper, UK between 1800 and 1870. And ultimately, which will of course include Valentine's, and ultimately, I hope there will be a book on the subject. Oh, that sounds exciting. I hope I see you before then, <laughs> before you're finished. You must come we'll see to you in Boston. 2026. Yes, yes that's mm -hmm. a long, long time away. But uh, happy collecting. Mm -hmm. You know, collections still come on the market. There are still things to be found. And having a little bit of knowledge is very helpful. I never used to even look at the envelopes people would come to some of the booths, the antique booths, and they would just look at the, the stamps and quickly buy them. I didn't know what I was missing until now. <laughs> so Nancy, are you going to exhibit your collection? Well, my collection, I do I do some, some talks, yes, but my collection is located at the Huntington Library in California. I donated it there and they have over 10,000 pieces. We hope to do an exhibit, but they do use some of the things in other collections. I collect other aspects of Valentine's like maps of matrimony and also the Froctor. It's expanded 
everything, <laughs> everything that related to love, I think. But the collection is, is in California and I'm in New Jersey, so I don't see it very often. But lots of people will be able to have access to it, which is exciting. I didn't want to you know, sell it at auction and uh, have it distributed at broken up after I spent, you know, 50 years trying to put together all the pieces of the puzzle. So it's uh, a collection of from the early devotionals and the things that are, you know, the pre the precursors of the Valentine also. So now I need, I need john's book on the printing so I can understand all of that. <laughs> but this has been wonderful. Thank you for inviting us. Well, thank you for attending and thank you for getting the word out. I think it's, um, yeah. it's, it's always nice. It, Valentine's Day is my favorite um, holiday. Until one, time I got I gave, married. one time I gave a talk on Valentine's Day and no one came. I think everyone had gone out to dinner. <laughs> you know, it was it was an evening Valentine's Day. So I never do them on Valentine's Day anymore yeah. before before or after. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of if we shifted it to, you know, if we did it next week. And I think John's giving a talk on Valentine's Day, oh, aren't you, John? It's not, it's actually on Valentine's Day. Yes. Is it? Yes. Well, people will it's come because he's famous. When I've I get booked mine, for... I'm a young collector, I don't know. <laughs> I've been booked for 2024 already for Valentine's Day. <laughs> uh, reservations. Uh, Linda, chime, chime right in. Yep, I, I'm mute though. Hold on. We'll get you to unmute. There you go. Yes, thank you. Um, this is my first time attending the group, and this was very charming. Thank you. Um, I wondered if I could uh, quickly share a screen. This is actually a homemade Valentine that I did a couple years ago for a young friend of mine in her 20s, a young professional who was going through all the agonies of dating and um she said she hated valentine's day so i made her an i hate valentine's day card <laughs> um that i would love to share if it's of any interest and go right not, ahead that's fine okay now let me see if i can share this screen this is going to take me a minute to bring up um and oh, okay i see it's going to give me an option of what i want to share um Okay, can you all see this? Not yet. In the right hand corner, you have to say allow. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so it says share. It says share. So you oh, okay. click on the screen and then you hit share. Okay, in the right hand corner of that little box, it will say share. It's a blue share button. Honey, I don't have that. Yeah, I don't so, have it either. I have an arrow that I just clicked. Okay, so when you click on the green share, a window pops up, right? Oh, I see. oh got it. Got it. Okay. There we go. Great. So that's the graphic. So I'm going to blow this up a little bit. Um, well, you can see it's like a really mangled heart that looks kind of like it's bleeding. And then the text is all mm. these word shallow commercial and sincere fake let's see masterpiece and so <laughs> forth so when you fold it over in the middle it opens up and it has all those things in it so <laughs> so that was all but she enjoyed it very much and actually you know people in their 20s don't get um i just stopped sharing there so they don't really get mail you know except for bills possibly so she really appreciated that somebody actually <laughs> sent her uh something in the mail <laughs> yeah now i think now they're sending even sending gift cards it's like i asked myself what do you want for valentine's day so, so just give me an uber eats gift card oh dear yeah <laughs> such is life but john and claire that was really nice i put the postal history um website in the chat too if people want to uh look at that that site claire's the you're the editor of that aren't you and um, has, yes i'm the editor of the uh, the journal yeah and i hear it's pretty interesting so i, I can't wait to there's going to be an article in there from 
John, right? Is it? Yes, it, we, we have a combined, well, he's, it's a, the, the material is combined in the, in, in my death collection, I've got these um, morning covers that are called Oxford bordered uh, morning covers where they're sort of cross hatched in the black. But you also get the envelope in blue and you also get it in um, cool. carmine. So, but you very rarely find the writing paper to go with the envelopes um, because most collectors take the contents of an envelope and throw it away. Um, but we actually managed to find an envelope with uh, a letter. So I got John to write an article for me, um, which combined both collections, talking about the Oxford borders envelopes. And unlike most stationery, it has a it has a diamond registration mark, patent registration mark on it, which is it's very difficult to see on the embossed one. But when they did, on, I've got one sheet of printed paper. And it has the diamond embossed mark, uh, so you can date it. And it also has the monogram of the publisher, T. S. and Co., which took me ages to find, but I did eventually find their patent in the National Archive here. And that's a firm called Terry Stoneman and Company. So they're, they're worth looking out for. They are in Ernest Mosher's book on morning covers, published in America. So the as people might know, I do morning covers. And that was when I heard Claire did that, I got all excited, even though it was a Valentine's Day hmm. presentation. But, um, and Pat, you, Pat um, and Dan, well, Dan Walker, you do, is a paper, you're a paper expert, aren't you? Uh, hold on, you have to unmute, hold on. Hold on, you have to unmute. There you go, okay. there you go. Uh there is a, um, a, a re retired Dr. Robert Heisey who managed paper mills throughout his life. And uh, uh, I go to him with all my papers. I'm working on the Indian feudatory state of, of Poonch and they have all kinds of batoni paper, lay paper, uh, uh, and I'm just having a ball and I can go to him uh, down the street, and uh, I talk to them and get a lot of good ideas about paper. So, hmm. have you ever seen that lace paper that John showed? All that intricate cutouts? Stuff? Not on stamps. <laughs> no, I <haven't>. Well, <laughs> so well, that was very interesting. Yes. Ed Siskin, hello. Oh, Mark, please. Uh, yeah, chime yeah. In. This question's for you, Joan. How early? do we have morning covers? Because I have uh, morning covers with penny reds, but I've not seen a penny black morning cover. I'm sure they're out there. Yeah, they uh, are. Yeah, how, they are. Yeah. <laughs> how early do we have morning covers? Are they in the pre-stamp? Yes. Oh, yes. 18, I'd say 1800. Yes. I think I've I have seen... a set, yeah, I have a 17 something, they, but mm -hmm. they weren't covers per se, right? They were just folded no. letter sheets with black, yeah. black borders. Yeah. And then they were sealed with the black wax. I mean, that, the whole black border comes from the Roman Catholic Church who um, printed a notice of death, which had a black, big black border on it. And they were stuck on the outside of the church buildings to notify people of the death. Um, I do have a, a, a couple of copies in my collection, um, but as you can imagine, those are very difficult to get hold of because not many survive. Um, you also would get them with the early newspapers with the death of somebody who was important. The, the piece that actually mentioned their funeral would have a black border around it. And any early elegies um, you would find with, would have black borders. Um, but because you have to put it also into context that paper was expensive, printing was expensive and postage was expensive. So you had to be quite wealthy to have um, decorated stationery, which is why it's, it's not common and it, it's only as uh, printing got cheaper and the, the, you see more of it. Good, thank you. So we went from love to death, <laughs> all in one, one webinar.
That's what's fascinating about John and uh, John and Claire. I, I thought that was so cool. It was like both ends, almost two opposite ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. So, well, it's pretty late over there in England. So I thank you so, so much for. Yeah, it's nearly half past 12. Oh. We're tomorrow here. Yeah? Yes. Wow, Frank. Sorrento Cortez. There's people from Mexico here too, India. Yes. That that is great. Bob Vogel. So, are there forged Valentines? How's that one? I, I looked at Bob Vogel and I said, "Hmm." <laughs> I've never seen a forged Valentine. But as I say, I think dealers do. There's an, um, a sort of incentive to put a, a Valentine card into an otherwise empty envelope and sell it for more than you might otherwise. Take mm. liberties, huh? <laughs> mm. Yeah. All right. Well. Is there any other questions? Do we have any other questions or comments? Or are we all just ready to? <laughs> I'd like to thank everybody for for attending tonight. These are these are always fun. So I love the question and answer. Yes, thank you very much on showing us some excellent material. I've never seen them before. Oh. Thank you all for thank you all for listening. Mm -hmm. okay. Karen, you're you're you were on the Victorian board. I'm trying to get her comment up. Yes, I've been on the the board of the Victorian Interdisciplinary Studies Association for oh, so long I'm screwing up the name. <laughs> it, it's a group of scholars, uh, art historians, historians, and English professors out on the West Coast. But I recently moved to Rhode Island, so I have to make a decision here. <laughs> so do they do they study the Valentines or all customs, Victorian? It's all customs Victorian, but everybody, I have never seen a presentation on Valentine's as a form, and that's kind of an oversight, I think. Um, it's an important form of communication. So I'm not coming at it from a stamp, a stamp angle, but just a general popular culture angle. They're beautiful. Uh, I want to find gold. Yeah. Catherine Golden did a wonderful presentation for us early on on how the penny black really evolutionized communication in England. So it, it, so it postal postal art of they could be postal artifacts in social in the social history, and that's one of the fun things about stamps is you don't have to think only about the stamps. You, it's mm -hmm. much broader. Yeah, it's big, major. And all the authors talked about it. Well, thank you. I really appreciated it, John. Oh, well, thank you. If any of the students need um, resources, I'm sure most of the most of the philatelists will be very help you know, very helpful, and sharing their knowledge and you know even showing them some of the examples. What a wealth, guys! This is great. Well, thank you for joining us. Thank you. I've got to sign off. I have to write to somebody right now, believe it or not. <laughs> but thank happy you. Valentine's Day to everyone. Yeah, happy yeah. Valentine's, yeah. Happy Valentine's yeah. Day. Yes. And Nancy, people who are interested in joining your society could go on Facebook? Yes, absolutely. Okay. National Valentine Collectors Association. And we also have a sister site, which is the marketplace where people can buy and sell. And we have, we have 1,150 people on that site right now. It's amazing. Wow. Interested in all kinds of Valentines. And we, we support from the early and rare to the modern, you know, postcards, everything. And uh, everyone is very enthusiastic. We've had a big discussion just yesterday about comic Valentines and how risque some can be. I posted one. I thought maybe I would get banned from Facebook, but nothing happened. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now we have a lot of a lot of people who are interested and eager to learn, and so that's what we're trying to do. 
So come look on, on Facebook and I'd be happy to, you have to, you know, give me your email or say that you want to join and be happy to have you join us. Oh, well, if, if you guys ever need a forum for, you know, for a social group, you're welcome to use this platform free oh, of charge. Thank you so much. I don't know why my camera is not working. It says it will only work if I turn on FaceTime. And when I do that, uh, I lose you. So I even comb my hair and everything for today. But <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it's been a pleasure and I'm delighted to see you all and you know, Thank you. Share, share our passion. Nancy, can I ask you a question? Absolutely. What would you say is the best book you've seen about Valentine's in general? Well, you know, I've always been surprised that so little has been appears to have been written. I about keep them. planning. I keep planning to write one, and you're going to be writing something. I still love Frank Staff's book. I mean, yes. I think that that was the basis for my own collection and for a, a number of others. Um, everything else that seems to have flaws, and uh, I can't recommend. I mean. Ruth Webb Lee's book came first, and, and it's a wonderful book, uh, but I, I prefer Frank Staff. I think it's solid. Lots of interesting, lots of wonderful information. And as I said, I think I patterned my own collection. I, I was able to acquire a number of things that were shown in his book and in Ruth Webb Lee's book, so that's always kind of exciting. And just recently acquired a, a copper plate engraving for a Valentine, and that was even more exciting because that had the name of the, the, the company that made the plate on the back. So, uh, you know, mm. and it was a company that, uh, that printed plates for Blake and Crookshank. So it's a, a nice time period. So that's always looking for unusual finds, the rare and, you know, unusual. Tells the whole story. Mm. Mm. I know very little about the philately. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Well, this, you know, it's really interesting how Valentine's just in those cards, and that's one of the reasons morning covers are neat, is they actually transcend the social and the, um, and the philatelic. And many of the morning cards, the elaborate cards, not the covers, were printed by companies that made lace paper, too. You know, that's an interesting aspect. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, onward. <laughs> we can discuss all kinds of things. Embossed in the morning card. Yeah, the embossed ones. When you combine wow. the embossed work and, and the um, cut work. Right. I mean, they are exquisite works of art. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And the motifs in the embossing are often, you know, the, the cherubs and cupids. And, and uh, it, I mean, they're just very tender. And... Mm. Uh, so, typical morning images. I love it all. <laughs> and Chris Dorn, are you all ready for your presentation next month? I've been working on it today, in fact. So uh, I'm trying to I'm trying to get uh, trying to get it pulled together here. So uh, I'll I'll be ready by then for sure. But uh, the the question is when when will I have it ready to to send over with the. Uh, you know, in advance kind of thing. Yeah, as long as it's two minutes in a, ahead of time. <laughs> <laughs> two minutes. Yeah, it, be, it better be more than that or I'm going to be in trouble myself. <laughs> well, I just threw up, a, I threw up a block that was, you know, I just happened to have hanging around from the last sale. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you can't get rid of it, uh, I'd take it for cheap. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, it's funny because we we found a bunch more in the collection, which is always, you know, just when you think you're all done, right? Yeah, yeah. That multiples like that are, uh, you know, th those are those are fabulous, uh, fabulous pieces of material. Yeah. Someone bought the morning cover that I really wanted, so I was. It was a beautiful morning cover with. Uh, you know, the blocks, it was in row, the rose um, cable controls. I think there was two pairs in a single. It was gorgeous. So a, mo a morning cover with cape triangles on it? Yes. Oh, wow. I've it never seen beautiful. one. It was beautiful. I have I, never yeah. seen one. That would, that would be That's something. Right. Holy moly. Sure. Yeah. yeah. I was hoping it wouldn't sell, but they intervened. You know, I mean, that's a bad thing to say as an auctioneer, but yeah. yeah. Well, anyway. 
Keith wouldn't let me, you know, he's like, you can't bid, you can't bid. So went to a good home, I'm sure. If you'll excuse us, I think we're going to retire to bed. Okay. Well, thank <laughs> you so, quite, so much, John. This is fantastic. Here, thank, thank you, you Jan. That was wonderful. Goodbye. Love Bye. to you. So many years. Take care.